Section 24 of My Strange Rescue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley. Section 24 Wrecks and Wreckers of the Anticosti right in the mouth of the great st lawrence which without exaggeration has been called the noblest the purest the most enchanting river on all god's beautiful earth lies a long narrow island that might with equal propriety be called the dreariest most inhospitable and most destructive island on the earth for it is doubtful if any other spot of corresponding size has caused so many shipwrecks and so much human suffering in ten years according to official records there have been as many as one hundred and six wrecks including seven steamships and sixty-seven sailing ships or barks having on board no less than three thousand precious souls and cargoes worth millions of pounds years ago before the canadian government erected lighthouses and established relief stations the wrecks were more numerous still and were rarely unattended with loss of life but times are better now and when a wreck occurs unless it be one of those terrible winter storms that seem to make this ill-omened isle their centre the crew generally manage to make the island in safety where they are well cared for by the government officials far different was it in seventeen thirty seven when the french sloop of war la renommee stranded upon a cruel ledge of rocks hardly a mile offshore about eight leagues from the southern point of anticosti it was in the month of november just as winter which could nowhere have been more dreadful than on that bleak barren shelterless island was fast closing in in their mad haste to reach the land for the waves were breaking high over the vessel the crew took little food with them although gallant captain de freneuse did not forget to take the ship's colours when in the grey grim morning they came to reckon up they found to their dismay that with six months of hopeless captivity before them they had barely enough food for forty days allowing the scantiest of daily rations to each of the sixty-five men who had survived the shipwreck the sequel as related with simple graphic pathos by father crispel one of the few who ultimately emerged from the terrible ordeal constitutes as grand a record of human courage and endurance and as harrowing a history of human suffering as ever has been told the poor castaways had nothing but a little canvas to shelter them from the keen biting blasts fever presently broke out amongst them then half of them set forth in two small boats to coast around that merciless shore for forty leagues after which they made a hazardous dash across twelve leagues of open sea to mingan where french fishermen were known to winter the jolly boat was swamped after they had been five days out and its thirteen occupants were thus spared further misery at last the ice setting in made the progress of the other boat impossible and they had no alternative but to go into winter quarters and wait for the tardy spring with two pounds of damp mouldy flour and two pounds of unsavoury fox meat per day these seventeen men housed in rude huts of spruce boughs prepared to endure the long agony of winter once a week a spoonful of peas were served out to each man which constituted such a treat that as father crispel naively puts it on those days we had our best meal hunger cold and disease carried off one by one as the months dragged themselves along until at length only three still lived when a band of indians came just in time to save this remnant from perishing all this and more is told by heroic father crispel with a quaint simplicity a minuteness of detail and a perfect submission to the divine will that renders his recital extremely touching not less saddening is the story of the stout brig granicus 
which in eighteen twenty eight went to pieces off the east end of the island also in the month of november many of the crew escaped to land but with little more than the clothing they wore winter soon closed in upon them no succor came their provisions gave out and what followed may be judged from the awful sight that met the eyes of some government officials when the following spring they stumbled across a rude hut strewn with human skeletons and in the pot that hung over the long dead ashes some bones that were not those of an animal those dreadful days are happily past and gone few lives are lost on anacosti now four fine lighthouses send their cheering rays across the anxious mariner's path signal guns and steam whistles sound friendly notes of warning when the frequent fogs dim the lights and half a dozen telegraph stations at different points are ready to speed at once the news of disaster to the mainland by means of the submarine cable where wrecks are plentiful and the controlling hand of the law is absent wreckers are sure to be plentiful also anticosti has been no exception to this rule the island has had its share of those who did not hesitate to pursue this nefarious business from the earliest times the place has held out attractions to the fisherman and the hunter the cod halibut herring and other fish that it pays to catch abound along the coast huge lobsters play hide-and-seek among the seaweeds and very good salmon and trout may be caught in some of the streams while round-headed mild-eyed seals spend the greater part of the year sporting in the waves or basking on the shore then away inland there are or used to be bears otters martins and foxes to be had for the shooting or trapping coming first to fish and hunt the fishermen and hunters in many cases stayed to play the part of wreckers there was a good deal more money to be made out of the flotsam and jetsam that the storm sent their way than out of fish or fur and they made the most of their opportunities one thing however must be said in their behalf they have never been accused of luring vessels to destruction by false lights or of confirming their title to the goods cast up by the sea by acting upon the principle that dead men are not competent witnesses in court and by dispatching any of the shipwrecked who might have survived the disaster on the contrary more than one unfortunate crew have owed the preservation of their lives to these very wreckers the most renowned of them all a man of whom it might in truth be said that there was not a st lawrence pilot or a canadian sailor who knew him not by reputation or a parish between quebec and gaspe where marvellous tales were not told about him around the evening fire was louis olivier gamache in these stories he figured as the beau ideal of a pirate half ogre half sea wolf who enjoyed the friendship and special protection of a familiar demon the learned and loquacious abbe ferland in his dainty little volume of opus cules which i hold in my hand tells us about this wonderful gamache that according to popular rumour he had been seen to stand upright upon the thwarts of his sloop and command the demon to bring him a capful of wind instantly his sails were filled though the sea around him was in a glassy calm and away he went while all about him were vessels powerless to move during a trip to ramowski he gave a grand supper to the devil not to a devil of the second class but to the veritable old gentleman himself aided by invisible assistance he had massacred whole crews and appropriated to himself the rich cargoes of their vessels when hotly pursued by a government boat sent to capture him and just about being overtaken both sloop and gamache suddenly disappeared leaving nothing behind but a blue flame that went dancing over the waves in mocking defiance of the disappointed minions of the law upon such thrilling legends as these was founded the reputation of the wizard of anticosti and so generally were they believed that the genial abbey assures us that the majority of the mariners in the gulf 
would rather have attempted to scale the citadel of quebec than to approach by night the bay where gamache was known to have his stronghold we can put plenty of confidence in the abbey for in the year eighteen fifty two he had the courage to pay the wizard a visit and i am sorry that i have not room to give the full particulars of that visit as they are brightly presented by this ever entertaining writer he found the terror inspiring gamache to be a tall erect and vigorous old man with snow-white hair but piercing eyes who came forward to meet his visitors with an easy dignified bearing that betrayed no concern or troubled conscience his house appeared to be a perfect arsenal of deadly weapons no fewer than a dozen guns many of them double-barrelled grimly adorned the walls of the first room they entered and every other room up to the very garret had at least two or three more loaded and capped they hung upon racks surrounded by powder flasks shot bags swords sabres daggers bayonets and pistols in most imposing profusion the house itself was something of a fortress every possible precaution had been taken to prevent persons entering it without the permission of its master all the doors and windows were strongly barred and shuttered and so complete were the defences that one man inside might have defied twenty outside in the sheds arranged in the most orderly manner were long rows of barrels bales casks and other gifts of the sea such was the den of the dreaded wrecker a man not one tithe so bad as wild rumour made him but who nevertheless took pains to intensify the public feeling about himself in order that he might be the more undisturbed in the solitude he had chosen for himself in that strange wild place he had not always been alone either twice had a woman been found willing to brave the rigours of his life for love of him and in both cases they had succumbed to the terrible loneliness and desolation his second wife died suddenly while he was off on a hunting trip in midwinter and he returned after a fortnight absence to find her frozen form clasping to its icy breast the bodies of their two little children the one five and the other six years old that is how they will find me some day each one in their turn ah well since she is dead we can only bury her that was all the strange taciturn man said to his companion a hunter who had been with him and yet he had always shown his wife the greatest kindness and affection it was not that he was heartless but that he would rather have died than reveal the depth of his feeling he amused the abbey very much by relating the various devices to which he had resorted in order to heighten his reputation for diabolic associations he would go to a country inn for instance order a supper for two to be served in a private room stating that he expected a gentleman in sable garments to share it with him when the supper was ready he would then lock himself up in the room polish the supper off unaided and summon the astonished landlady to clear the remains away as he and his friend had supped and were satisfied he would further increase their mystification by sundry rappings and inexplicable openings and shuttings of doors he could also employ more sinister means of protecting himself when necessary one day when he was quite alone a canoe glided into the bay and presently a gigantic montagne indian stepped ashore armed to the teeth and advanced with a firm step towards the house he was evidently crazed with fire-water and gamache felt in no mood to try a tussle with so brawny an opponent standing in the doorway with a rifle in his hands he called out in his sternest tones stop i forbid you to advance the intruder took not the slightest notice of him take another step and i fire shouted gamache the step was taken but before it could be repeated the rifle spoke and the indian fell his thigh bone smashed with the bullet in an instant gamache was beside the wounded man removing his weapons he lifted him to his shoulder and bore him tenderly to the house 
and there nursed him until he was completely recovered then filling his canoe with provisions he sent him back to his tribe with a warning never to intrude upon gamish again unless he wanted a bullet through his head instead of his thigh in eighteen fifty four louis olivier gamish died like his poor wife alone and unattended for weeks no one had visited his abode and when at last some seafarers chanced that way they found only the corpse of the once dreaded wizard whose supposed league with evil spirits did not avail to save him from fulfilling his own prophecy the wrecks continue at anticosti not long ago the shattered skeletons of four fine ocean steamers might have been seen upon its fatal shores but with gamish the reign of the wreckers ended never to return end of section twenty four Section 25 of My Strange Rescue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley. Section 25 A Lumber Camp. There is no summer in a Canadian lumber camp. That is to say, there is nobody in the camp in summer, which amounts to the same thing. The season of activity in the camps, or the shanties, as they are generally called, extends from late September to early April, and all summer long they are left to the care of birds that chirp and squirrels that chatter on the roof. In the month of September, the Canadian lumberman joins the gang of sturdy, active men who are bound for the shanties, where a winter of hard work awaits them. For him, the forests exist only to be remorselessly cut down, but though he may never stop to think about it, his is a very romantic and fascinating occupation. September is one of the loveliest months in the Canadian calendar. The days are still long and sunny. The heat of summer has passed away and the chill of autumn not yet come. One cloudless day follows another, and nature seems to be doing her best to make existence a delight. This is the time when the shantymen gather into gangs and by rail or steamer journey northward until they pass the limits of settlement. Then, taking to Shank's mare, they make their way into the depths of the forest. Let us follow a gang that is going upon a limit still untouched by the axe, far up the Black River, a tributary of the Ottawa, a hundred miles or more from the nearest village. This gang consists of about forty men, including the foreman, clerk, carpenter, cook, and chore boy, all active, sturdy, and good-natured fellows. Most of them are French Canadians, habitants, as the local term is, but English, Scotch, and Irish are found among them too, and often quite swarthy, wild-eyed men whose features tell plainly of Indian blood. Scouts have previously selected the best site for the camp. It is usually in the midst of the bunch of timber to be cut, so that little time may be lost in going and coming. On arriving, the first thing done by the gang is to build the shanty, which is to be its home during the long cold winter. This edifice makes no pretense to architectural beauty, but nothing could be better adapted to its purpose. It is an illustration of simplicity and strength combined. With all hands helping heartily, a shanty 40 feet long by 28 feet wide can be put up in five days. Meantime, the builders live in tents. This is the way they go about it. First of all, a number of trees are cut down. The trunks, cleared of all their branches, are sawed into proper lengths, and then laid one upon another until an enclosure with walls eight feet high is obtained. Upon the top of these walls strong girders are stretched, which are supported in the center by four great pillars called scoop bearers. Then comes the roof. A Canadian shanty roof is neither tiled nor shingled, but scooped. What is a scoop? It is a piece of timber, something like a very long railway tie one side of which is hollowed out, trough-wise, clear to the ends. Place two of these side by side, with the concave sides upward. Then lay another on top of them, concave side down, so that the edges overlap and fall into the troughs, and you have a roof that will defy the heaviest rains or wildest snowstorms that Canada can produce. A floor of roughly flattened timbers having been laid, and a door cut, it only remains to construct the camboose, or fireplace, and the bunks, and the shanty is complete, provided, of course, every cranny in the walls has been chinked with moss and mud, 
and a bank of earth thrown up all around the outside to make sure that no drafts can sneak in when the mercury is far below zero. The camboose is quite an important affair and occupies the place of honor in the center of the room between the four massive scoop bearers. Its construction is as rude and simple as that of the rest of the shanty. A bank of sand about two feet deep and six feet square makes the hearth. Over it hang two wooden cranes that hold the capacious kettles, which are always full of the pea soup or fat salt pork that constitutes the chief items in the shantyman's bill of fare. A mighty fire roars and crackles unceasingly upon the hearth, its smoke escaping through a square hole in the roof, a hole so big that one may lie in the bunks and study the stars. This rude chimney secures the best of ventilation to the shantyman. The bunks, which are simply sloping platforms about seven feet in length, running around three sides of the room, offer the sweet allurement of the soft side of a plank to the tired toilers at the close of the day. Such is a shanty of the good old-fashioned sort. In later days, such refinements of civilization as windows, stoves, and tables have been added by progressive lumbermen but there are still scores of shanties to which the above description applies. The shantymen are now ready to begin operations against the great trees that have been standing all about, silent, unconscious spectators of the undertaking. The forty men are divided according to the nature of their work. The clerk, cook, and chore boy are the home guard. The others, according to their various abilities, are choppers, road cutters, teamsters, sawyers, and chainers. The only duty requiring explanation is that of chore boy. It is usually performed by the youngest member of the gang, although sometimes it falls to the lot of a man well up in years. The chore boy is the cook's assistant and general utility worker of the shanty. He has to chop the firewood, draw the water, wash the dishes, and perform a multitude of such odd jobs, in return for which he is apt to get little thanks and much abuse. The choppers have the most important and interesting part of the work. They always work in pairs and go out against the trees armed with a keen axe apiece and a cross-cut saw between them. Having selected their victim, say a splendid pine towering more than a hundred feet in the air, they take up their position at each side. Soon the strokes of the axes ring out in quick succession. For some time the yellow chips fly fast, and presently a shiver runs through the tree's mighty frame. One of the choppers cries warningly to the other, who hastens to get out of the way. A few more strokes are given with nice skill. Then comes a rending crack, whose meaning cannot be mistaken, and the stately tree, after quivering a moment as though uncertain which way to fall, crashes headlong to the ground, making a wide swath through the smaller trees standing near. A good chopper can lay his tree almost exactly where he likes, and yet somehow accidents are of frequent occurrence. Every winter additions are made to the long list of men whom the trees have succeeded in involving in their own ruin. A gust of wind, the proximity of another tree, or some such influence may cause the falling trunk to swerve and fall with fatal force upon the unwary chopper. The tree felled, the next proceeding is to strip it of its branches, and saw it up into as many logs as can be got from it. Two, three, four, or even as many as five logs may be obtained from a single tree, the length of each being thirteen and a half feet or sixteen and a half according to the quality. The odd half-foot is allowed for the brooming of the ends as the logs make their rough journey down the streams to the mills. Eighty logs felled, trimmed, and sawed is quite an ordinary day's work for one pair of choppers, and when the choppers have been striving, that is, each pair trying its best to outdo the others, six hundred logs have been turned in by a single pair as the splendid result of a week's work. The logs are at first piled up on rollways, which are simply two tree trunks placed a little distance apart. Later on, when the roadmakers have done their part, the teamsters bear them off to the bank of the stream or out upon the ice of the lake, where they wait the coming of spring to begin their journey by water to the mills. The shantyman leads a free, hearty, healthy life. From dawn until dark he works in the open air, exercising lungs and muscles. When the autumn rains are over and the snow has come to stay, he breathes for four months the clear, cold, bracing air of the Canadian winter, fragrant with the scent of pine and cedar. No matter how fond of drink he may be, not one drop of liquor can he have, although he may and does drink long and deep from the cup that cheers. His fare possesses at least two sterling merits. It is substantial in quality and unlimited in quantity. He enjoys it most when the day's work is over, and no less weary than hungry, he trudges home to the shanty. There he finds the warm welcome of a steaming supper awaiting him.
Drawn up about the blazing fire, he sees a pot of excellent pea soup, a boiler of strong tea, a big pan full of fat pork fried and floating in gravy, another pan containing slices of cold boiled pork, huge loaves of bread, baked in great iron pots buried deep in the ashes of the camboose, and better than city baker ever made, and a pile of bright tin basins. Picking up two of the basins, he fills one with soup and the other with tea. Helping himself to a generous slice of the hot bread, he makes use of it as a plate for a slice of the pork. Then he retires to the edge of his bunk, and with the aid of his clasp knife, discusses this solid, if not varied, repast. There's not much change in the bill of fare all winter. Occasionally, perhaps, if the roads permit, fresh beef on foot will be sent up from the depot, and the lumbermen may enjoy the luxury of steaks and roasts. Quite often, too, a bit of game will fall in their way while they are working in the woods. Great is the rejoicing when Francois or Alec succeeds in bringing down a fat deer. Bear steak, too, is not unknown. The bear is trapped in a deadfall, or small hut, above the door of which a heavy log is hung in such a way that it drops with crushing force upon the bear, pushing in to get at the bait. Sometimes the shantymen do a little trapping on their own account. One of them, who wished to obtain a fine bearskin, paid dearly for his prize. He had set his steel spring trap, and returning after an interval, found that it had disappeared. The marks in the snow made tracking easy, and hurrying along, he presently reached a great log over which the trap had evidently been dragged. His haste made him careless, and springing across the broad trunk without stopping to reconnoiter, he threw himself right into the arms of the bear. The animal, weary of dragging the heavy trap, was resting on the other side. The hunted creature was furious with pain. The shantyman's only weapon was a sheath knife, which he drew and stabbed the bear again and again in the breast. But stab as he might, he could not loose the brute's fatal grasp. Next day his comrades, anxiously following up his trail, found him dead, with the dead bear's paws still holding him fast. The shantyman's recess comes when the evening meal has been dispatched. He has an hour or more before bedtime. It is pipes all round and song and joke and story win generous applause from the not overcritical audience. The French Canadians are especially fond of singing. They have many songs, some of which, like A la Claire Fontaine and En Roulant Ma Boule, are full of spirit and beauty. If Francois or Alec has remembered to bring his fiddle with him, and he seldom forgets it, the singing is sure to be followed by dancing as the evening goes on. Bedtime comes early in the shanty. By nine o'clock at the latest, all have turned in. The process of going to bed consists simply in taking off one's coat and boots, and rolling up snugly in a couple of thick blankets. Many a millionaire would gladly give one of his millions for the ability to sleep as soundly and restfully in his soft bed as does the shanty man upon his pine boards. In the dusk of early morning, the foreman's loud voice is heard calling to the men, Turn out now and get your breakfast. The lumberman has been asleep ten good hours, but he feels as if he has just laid down. Sunday is the day the shanty man likes best. No work is done upon that day. He can spend the time as he pleases. Generally, he is content to lounge about smoking and enjoying the luxury of doing nothing. A religious service is so rare a treat that when there is one, all attend it without reference to their creed. Thus the long winter slips by. The logs accumulate upon the river bank or out upon the icy lake. When the warm days of spring come, the lumberman's labors are at an end, so far as the shanty is concerned. The great spring drive begins. The logs start upon their journey southward, and the shantyman becomes a river driver. Armed with pike pole or camp hook, he hurries his awkward squads of logs downstream as a shepherd drives his flock to market. This is often a very exciting and dangerous occupation. The Canadian rivers abound in falls and rapids, past which the flocks of tree trunks have to be guided skillfully. Many a time the river driver's life is in peril as he wades through turbulent ice-cold water or leaps from rock to rock or from log to log in his efforts to prevent his charges from stranding. When the drive is finished, the shantyman's labors are over until the return of autumn recalls him to the forest. End of section 25. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 26 of My Strange Rescue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Scott, Cheltenham, England.
My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley La Crosse What the game of cricket is to England, and the game of baseball to the United States, is the game of lacrosse to Canada. And yet it is worth noting that both cricket and baseball flourish in Canada, which goes to show that the young Canadian seeks for quantity as well as quality in his sport. The Indians invented lacrosse, just as they invented the canoe, the snowshoe, and the toboggan, and it is not likely that their pale-faced brother will be able to invent something surpassing any of them. How long ago they invented lacrosse is a question not even Parkman nor Catlin can tell us. The Redskins have never had newspapers, and seem to have been poor hands at keeping diaries. Consequently, we can never hope to know when first the Iroquois champion team, led by the famous chief Throw the Ball Half a Mile, defeated the Cree champions under the no less renowned Stop It With His Stomach Every Time. Catlin, who saw it played by 600, 800, or even 1,000 Choctaws at a time, tells us that the players would trip and throw each other and sometimes take flying leaps over the heads of their stooping opponents, or dart between their extended legs. There are times, he adds, when the ball gets to the ground, when there is a confused mass of stick shins and bloody noses. I may add on my own account that those times are not altogether past and gone. Scratched shins and crimson noses are still to be found on the lacrosse field. There is, of course, a good deal of difference between lacrosse as played by the whites today and as it was played by the redskins half a century ago in the first place the ground was not a level smooth-shaven lawn with a cinder path around it and beyond that rows of seats for spectators but a glade in the forest interspersed with stumps of trees fallen trunks and clumps of young spruce the goals were single poles or stakes, about eight feet high, and the distance between them varied in proportion to the number of players from 500 yards to half a mile or even more. Then the cross was much shorter and smaller as to its netting, while among some tribes no netting at all was used, but instead thereof two sticks having spoon-shaped ends between which the ball was caught and carried. As to the dress of the players, well, the difference is not so very great. The white men wear a little more on their backs, and canvas shoes instead of moccasins on their feet, and that is about the sum of the matter. I will now try to describe the game as it is played by the Canadian clubs today. The ground should be a smooth level field 150 yards in length by 100 in breadth at the very least and for championship matches another fifty yards each way is most desirable the goals should be one hundred and twenty five yards apart but a lesser distance may be agreed upon between the two captains if the nature of the ground requires it the side boundaries are formed by the fence or ring of spectators as the case may be if the ball goes over the one or gets tangled up with the other it has to be brought out and faced the nature of facing will be explained further on. The goals are simply two poles six feet high and six feet apart, and in front of them, at a lacrosse stick's length from their base, a line is marked with whitewash, inside of which no attacking player must enter unless the ball has preceded him. If he enters in advance of the ball, the goalkeeper may drive him out at the point of his stick and use any violence necessary for that purpose. The side consists of 12 players and a captain. The captain does not play, he simply runs round and shouts at the other fellows. It looks like an easy job, but it is far from being so. Upon the captain very often depends the fate of his team, and he should always be a cool, clear-headed, experienced player thoroughly up to all the tricks and subtleties of the game the lacrosse sticks or crosses as they are called are light strong sticks made of either hickory ash or rock elm the indian preferring the first because of its strength and the white man the other two because of their lightness there is no rule as to the length of a stick but practical experience has shown that the most convenient length 
is equal to the distance from the toe to the hollow under the arm. Each player can therefore suit himself in the matter. The netting is of gut and should be about 29 inches long and must not be more than 12 inches wide at its widest part. 9 inches is a good average width. There must be no bag to the netting, and to guard against this, the referee is required to inspect the crosses carefully before allowing the match to begin. The ball is of sponge India rubber, about half an inch less in circumference than a baseball, and weighing about four ounces. It should bounce freely, as this adds greatly to the uncertainty and interest of the game. All the preliminaries having been satisfactorily arranged, a fine day, a good ground, and a large gathering of spectators secured, we will suppose that a championship match between the representative teams of Montreal and Toronto is about to take place. At the appointed hour, the teams issue from their dressing rooms amid the cheers of their adherents and line up before the referee and umpires. That is, they face one another in two parallel lines, and then the referee proceeds to examine their crosses lest they should be bagged and their shoes lest they may be spiked he also addresses a word of warning to them upon the subject of rough play which unhappily has become far too common of late he then dismisses them and they take up their places on the field when this is done they take their positions in pairs each man having an opponent opposite him thus the montreal goalkeeper has the toronto inside home just in front of him each of the fielders has a man to cover him as the term is and there is a toronto center as well as a montreal center the game is begun by the two center fielders they half kneel opposite each other and lay their crosses on the ground face to face every nerve and muscle tingling with excitement for much may depend upon which gets the advantage at the start this is called facing the ball and when the referee is satisfied that everything is in readiness he places a ball between the two crosses taking care that it is exactly in the middle at his shout of play the two centers strive by a sharp sudden twist of the cross each to draw the ball in his own direction the successful one immediately passes it to the nearest fielder on his own side who is instantly pounced upon by his cover and then the fun begins in fierce earnest it is quite out of the question to convey through the medium of print any adequate conception of the interest and excitement that a game of lacrosse between two well-matched teams affords for brilliancy of individual effort, as well as of combined team play, for incessant movement and thrilling situations, for cheer-inspiring displays of undaunted pluck or untiring fleetness, there is no game that can compare with it. The ball flies all over the field, now soaring like a bird through the air, now skimming along the ground like a frightened field mouse first one goal is in danger and the players crowd so thickly about it that you cannot see the goalkeeper then a long throw from his skilful stick sends the rubber away off to the side or perhaps almost down to the other goal and two dangers are over for the time next an artful dodger will catch the ball on his cross and turning twisting dodging this way and that dropping the ball when checked only to pick it up again deftly after the checker is eluded will amid the shouts and cries of spectators and players alike carry it clear down the whole length of the field and perhaps if he be very lucky send a grounder between the goal posts ere the goalkeeper has time to recover from the surprise of his onset in the throwing, catching, checking, running, and dodging which the game calls for, every muscle and sinew is given fullest exercise, and every man in the team has a share of the work. There is no loafing possible in lacrosse, as there is in baseball and cricket, when the outfield are getting nothing to do. Even the goalkeeper has plenty of hard work, for whenever the ball goes behind the goalposts, he must go after it and struggle for it until he can send it either to one of his own side or far down the field indeed the ability to play well behind the flags is as important a quality in a goalkeeper as an argus-eyed watchfulness over what is going on in front of him 
while individual brilliancy grandstand play as it is sometimes called is all very well in its way good team playing is far more effective in the end and it is just because the whites excel in the latter that they have become more than a match for the redskins from whom they have adopted the game one of the prettiest sights imaginable is to see two expert players tobying to one another for perhaps half the length of the field before they can be stopped this tobying consists in their running along ten or fifteen yards apart and throwing the ball from one to the other so soon as there is danger of the one carrying it being checked another valuable accomplishment in a lacrosse player is knowing how and when to uncover that is to step away from the opponent who has been deputed to cover him and consequently be free to snatch up the ball the moment it comes his way when one team understands this better than the other the result is to convey the impression that it must have more players because there always seem to be two of them at least wherever the rubber is the game is won by the ball being thrown between the goalposts not higher than an imaginary line drawn across their tops it must of course be thrown through from in front formerly a match was decided by the winning of three games best three out of five but in one of the two lacrosse associations now existing in canada a change has been made and unless one team wins three games straight play must be continued for two hours and then the team having the most games wins the match the reason of the change was that in some cases a team would take three games from their opponents in a few minutes and at this the spectators grumbled the most interesting recent event in the history of the game in canada is the visit of the famous toronto twelve to great britain they are a splendid lot of players and seem to have it all their own way as might be expected the fact however that there are enough lacrosse clubs in the old country to make it worth their while to go over proves that the game is making progress round the world indeed it has been already heard of from australia india china and other far away quarters of the globe in the united states it is spreading rapidly and the time cannot be far distant when we shall have international struggles for supremacy in lacrosse as well contested as we already have in some other sports some years ago a team from the united states crossed the atlantic to contend against their british cousins and succeeded in winning every match they played but one End of section 26。section 27 of My Strange Rescue。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit LibriVox.org。recording by Gillian Hendry。My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley。Section 27. A Pillow Slip Full of Apples A and H-O-A-S. The Arch Room. Ten o'clock tonight. Bring a sheet and pillow slip. Abracadabra. Charlie Draper gazed at the piece of paper containing these simple words and mysterious signature with mingled feelings of pride and trepidation. Pride because it was the first time since his coming to Twin Elm Academy that he had been the recipient of one of these much prized missives, and trepidation because he had very vague notions of what his accepting the invitation it bore might entail. He was a new boy, just finishing his first month at the academy, and being of rather reserved disposition, had been slow in forming acquaintances. Indeed, but for an incident that suddenly brought him into prominence, he might have made still poorer progress in this direction than he did. A few days before this communication from Abracadabra, a party of the boys were bathing in the river near Deep Pool. A youngster, who could not swim, rashly ventured too near the pool, and disappeared in its dark depths. There arose an immediate chorus of cries from his companions, but no intelligent effort was being made at rescue. When Charlie Draper, who had not been of the party, came rushing up, threw off his cap and coat, plunged into the pool, and brought out the drowning boy at the first try. Of course he was a hero at once, 
and the leaders of the A and H O A S, the secret society of the academy, of which Charlie had already heard much, and admittance to which was the desire of his heart, lost no time in deciding that he was beyond question one of the right sort, and that he must become one of them forthwith. Hence the short but significant summons, whose contents have been already given. Promptly at ten o'clock, Charlie, in his stocking feet, and provided with pillow-slip and sheet, crept cautiously up the long stairs that led to the arch-room. All the students, except those who belonged to the society, were already sound asleep, and the two tutors who lived in the building, knowing nothing of this exception, and imagining that every cot was duly occupied, had settled down for a comfortable smoke and chat in the cosy sitting-room of Mr. Butler, whose quarters were farthest away from the arch-room. Upon all this the members of the society had astutely reckoned, and the coast was accordingly clear for them to do as they pleased, as long as they did not make too much noise about it. Bearing his note of invitation as a passport, Charlie approached the door of the arch-room. Suddenly, out of its shadow, a masked and draped figure darted, and putting its hand to his throat, inquired in a very husky voice, "'What doest thou here?' For answer, Charlie held up his sheet and slip of paper. "'Tis well. Pass on,' said the husky mystery. And with palpitating heart, Charlie tiptoed through the door. The moment he passed the portal, two other masked and draped figures seized him by either arm and hurried him before a fourth figure, who occupied a sort of throne at the far corner of the room. "'Whom do you bring before me?' asked this potentate, in the husky tone which seemed to be characteristic of the society. "'Charles Draper, may it appear your sublimity,' was the reply, accompanied by a reverent obeisance, in which Charlie was directed to join. "'He hath been well recommended to us. Let him be put to the tests. If he doth survive them, and will take the oaths, he may be admitted into membership. Then followed a lot of the usual elaborate nonsense, such as boys delight to invent and execute in connection with their secret societies, and at the end of fifteen minutes or so, Charlie, flushed and excited, but triumphant, was handed a gown and mask, and informed by the figure on the throne, whose official title was the same as the signature to the invitation, that he was duly admitted into the membership of the society, whose full name he now learned was the Ancient and Honourable Order of Apple Stealers. The next piece of information he received rather staggered him. It was that, according to the rules of the society, he must at once justify the confidence its members had reposed in him by proving his prowess as an apple stealer. The August Pippins in Squire Ribston's orchard were reported to be ready to drop into one's mouth. Upon the novice, Charles Draper, devolved the perilous duty of securing a generous sample of those juicy golden globes, so that the ancient and honourable order might pronounce judgment on their excellence. So soon as he understood this, Charlie began to wish he had not been in such a hurry to join the society. He had been at Twin Elm long enough to learn that old Squire Ribston's dogs were as good in their way as his apples were in theirs, and he did not at all relish the prospect of having an argument with them in their own territory at the dead of night. But he was too stout of heart to back out, or even to show any signs of flinching, as his sublimity proceeded to give him his instructions. Each member had brought a sheet with him. These were quickly converted into a rope, which reached from the window of the arch-room to the ground. Stuffing the pillow-slip into his pocket, and putting on his shoes, Charlie, amid the whispered commands of his companions, to "'Be sure and fill the pillow-slip. Don't call the dogs bad names. Give the compliments of the order to the squire if you happen to meet him,' and other inspiring injunctions, climbed carefully out of the window, and let himself down, hand over hand, to the ground pausing only to kiss his hand circus fashion to the faces at the window, he hastened off noiselessly over the dew-laden grass in the direction of the squire's orchard. 
he knew his route well enough, and the distance was not quite half a mile, so that a few minutes' quick walking brought him to his destination. The Ribston mansion stood well back from the road, and the orchard lay to its rear. Charlie therefore thought it well to leave the road before he reached the gate, and to take a slant through the fields that brought him up to the orchard fence, about fifty yards behind the house. Here he crouched down and listened, with strained ears and throbbing pulses, for the slightest sound that might indicate the proximity of a dog. But not a growl or bark, or even sniff, broke the clover-scented stillness. As it chanced, he had hit upon a particularly favourable night for his enterprise, the good squire being wont to spend his Friday evenings with admirable regularity at Dr. Aconite's, where the genial rector of St. David's and important judge Surrey Butter helped to make up a quartet that could play whist by the hour without so much as winking. For the sake of company on the way home, the squire always took his dogs with him, so that until his return, which was never later than eleven o'clock, the Ribston premises were entirely unguarded. Encouraged by the perfect silence, Charlie gently got over the fence, and, making his way to the august pippin tree, set diligently to work to fill his pillow slip. The boughs were bending low beneath their weight of juicy fruit, and he had no need to shake them. There were far more apples within easy reach of his hand than he could carry home. Five minutes sufficed to fill the pillow slip, and then, with a vast sigh of relief, he crawled back over the fence, hastened across the field, and came to the fence beside the road. Knowing nothing of the squire's whist club, he took it for granted that all danger was practically over, and without looking to right or left, he tossed his bag over the fence and vaulted lightly after it. Hardly had his feet touched the ground than a sharp, suspicious bark came from only a few yards away, and the next moment a collie dog, followed closely by a fox terrier, bounded toward him, barking fiercely, while, looming dimly through the darkness, the portly form of their owner could be descried, as he demanded angrily, "'Who are you, and what are you about?' Charlie could have answered both questions easily enough had he chosen to do so, but the time did not seem to him altogether favourable, and instead of a verbal reply, he picked up his pillow slip, threw it over his shoulder, and took to his heels, with the dogs after him in full cry. "'Catch him, Grip! Catch him, Oscar!' shouted the squire to his dogs, as he joined in the chase with all his might. Although hardly in condition for a sprinting match, Squire Ribston had been renowned for fleetness of foot in his younger days, and he showed a surprising turn of speed as he dashed down the road after the fleeing boy. Now, had Charlie dropped his heavy pillow slip, he might have distanced his human pursuer easily, and as the dogs seemed to be content with barking, and to have no idea of biting, the irate squire would never have known more about the daring raider of his orchard than his strong suspicion that it was one of those rascally twin elm boys. But to let go his burden was the last thing Charlie thought of doing. To his daring, determined nature, only two alternatives presented themselves, escape with his booty, or capture red-handed. So away he sped, holding tight to the pillowcase, the collie and terrier punctuating his strenuous strides with short, sharp barks. After his first furious spurt, the squire's speed rapidly slackened, until it became little more than a laboured jog-trot, and by the time he reached the entrance to the long avenue leading from the main road to the academy, Charlie was under the window, and jerking the sheet-rope by way of a signal to the boys to haul him up. Unfortunately, they were so occupied with some of their nonsense that they did not at first observe the signal, and precious moments were lost before they responded, so that Charlie's anxious ears caught the sound of the squire's panting as he toiled gamely along the avenue. "'Hurry up, boys!' he called, as loudly as he dared. "'The squire's after me!' The boys responded with a sudden jerk that snatched him off the ground and nearly made him drop the apples. Then up he went more steadily, foot by foot. But he was not halfway to the window when the squire, guided by his clever dogs, arrived upon the scene, and in spite of the semi-darkness, 
his keen old eyes took in the situation at a glance aha you young scoundrel i have you now take that and he hurled his stout oak cane at the ascending boy the result greatly exceeded his expectations for the stick going straight to its mark gave charlie such a stinging blow that he involuntarily let go of the weighty pillow-slip and dropped it down full upon the squire's pate crushing his tall grey beaver over his eyes and sending him headlong to the ground it was some moments before he could pick himself up again and by that time charlie was safe inside the window beside himself with wrath the squire assailed the front door with furious blows bringing both the tutors out in startled haste to them as well as his breathless disordered condition permitted he explained himself and was at once invited to enter while mr butler went for professor rodwell on the professor's arrival all the boys were summoned to appear in the schoolroom and presently in they flocked all but the members of the a and h o a s who by the way had managed to get into their nightgowns with marvellous celerity manifesting their innocence by their unmistakably startled sleepy faces are all the boys here asked the squire suspiciously on finding every one arrayed in his nightgown professor rodwell counted heads carefully yes squire all the boys are present he replied hm snapped the squire a clever trick but they can't pull the wool over my eyes in that way an anxious expectant hush following Professor Rodwell addressed the boys in grave, yet not unkindly tones. "'Young gentlemen, it is clear beyond possibility of denial that some of you have been guilty of robbing Squire Ribston's orchard. Now I dare say it will not be difficult to trace out the culprits, but I would much prefer that they should acknowledge their wrongdoing of their own accord. I therefore wait to give them the opportunity.' There was but a moment's pause, and then charlie draper stepping forward said in a steady voice looking full at professor rodwell it was i that took squire ribston's apples let me bear all the punishment a look of mingled surprise and relief came into the professor's troubled face and even the squire's anger wrinkled countenance seemed to take on a softer expression touched with approval of this frank avowal charles draper i am very sorry said professor rodwell slowly although you have been but a short time with us i had thought better things of you than this charlie's eyes fell and his lip began to tremble he was already feeling deep regret for his part in the matter and these gentle words touched him to the heart he was just about to express his contrition and ask for sentence upon himself when the squire exclaimed charlie draper is that charlie draper it is replied professor rodwell wondering why the squire asked the same boy that saved my little grandson hughie from drowning in deep pool a week ago yes squire the same boy replied the professor now beginning to catch the old gentleman's drift then cried the squire who was as quick of generous impulse as he was of temper jumping from his seat and advancing toward charlie i don't want this thing to go any further here's my hand my brave lad you're welcome to every apple on the tree if you'll only come after them in honest manly fashion and not be playing such foolish pranks skulking through the fields when you ought to be abed come now professor rodwell let's cry quits i'm willing to let the matter rest boys will be boys and if your boys will promise never to go out robbing orchards again i'll promise to let em into my orchard on saturday afternoons and take every apple they find in the grass so long as the crop lasts for a moment the boys were so bewildered by these astounding words that they could hardly credit their ears then a spontaneous cheer burst from their throats and the upshot of the whole matter was that they heartily gave the promise the squire asked and the professor, relieved beyond measure at the turn affairs had taken, dismissed them with the understanding that the night's doings should be no further inquired into, provided good behaviour was maintained in future. The pledge thus given, T. 
taking away from the A and H O A S its principal reason for existing under that name, did not, however, put an end to its career. It simply altered its title and amended its ways, and continued to flourish as vigorously as before, with Charlie Draper as one of its most popular and active members. End of section 27「Section 28 of My Strange Rescue – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry – My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley – Section 28 – Lost on Lake St. Louis – the great river St. Lawrence, as if not content with its ordinary ample breadth, a few miles above the city of Montreal, spreads out into a wide sheet of water, which is known as Lake St. Louis. Lake St. Louis is about twelve miles long, by eight in width at its widest part, and being famous for its cool breezes, the people from the city go out there in throngs every summer, so that its shores are well populated, as long as the thermometer keeps well above the seventy point. In winter, however, it is very different. Then Jack Frost has a confirmed habit of sending the mercury away down, 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 not only below freezing point, but below zero even, and the blue waters of the lake turn into a floor as hard as steel, over which the snows drift and pile up and scatter again in fantastic windrows until the warm spring sunshine melts them into soggy slush, and a little later rends the solid floor itself asunder, and sends it careering down the current in great jagged ice floes. There is nothing undecided about a Canadian winter. The Frost King means business from the start, and for three long months keeps a tight grip upon the land. Some winters, of course, he is more tyrannical than others. The Ross boys, for instance, thought that he had never before in their experience been so unmerciful as during the season that the event happened, about which I am now going to tell. Day after day, for weeks at a time, the thermometer would not get up to the zero mark at all, while it would at night drop as much as thirty points below it. "'Pon my word, this sort of weather isn't fair at all,' said Bob Ross in an impatient tone at the breakfast-table one morning. A fellow can hardly stir out of doors without getting his nose or ears nipped. My nose was frost-bitten for the third time last night, and that's a little too much of a good thing for me. "'Right you are, Bob,' chimed in Phil, his elder brother, from across the table. "'My poor ears have been nipped nobody knows how often. I expect one of them will drop off some fine day.' "'It's a keen winter, boys, no doubt,' asserted Mr. Ross. "'I don't remember many as sharp. "'But the longest winter has an end, "'and you'll forget all about the cold the first warm day that comes.' "'That may be, father,' answered Bob. "'But I'd like a little mild weather right now, "'if the weather clerk has no objections. "'You know we're going over to the church festival at Beauarnois tomorrow night.' and an eight-mile tramp in this cold weather is not just what I'm hankering for, though I mean to go all the same. My lad, when I was your age I would have thought nothing of double the distance, if only a certain person were at the end of it, replied Mr. Ross, with a meaning smile at his wife, as he added, but perhaps you have no such attraction. Not I, laughed Bob. I'm going for the sake of the supper, but I won't answer for Phil, looking quizzically at his brother, who blushed violently and made a timely diversion by springing up and saying, Come along, Bob, let us get at our work, cold or no cold. Whereupon the two lads went off together. Mr. Ross owned one of the largest and finest among the many farms that bordered upon Lake St. Louis. Although he was what might be called a gentleman farmer, he was a thoroughly practical farmer too. He made his farm pay him handsomely, and thought so well of his occupation that he had brought up his two boys to follow it also, 
when they were grown men he would divide the greater part of his property between them reserving only sufficient to keep himself and his wife in independent comfort during the remainder of their days the two sons phil and bob at the time of my story about sixteen and fourteen years of age respectively were as satisfactory a pair of boys as parents could wish one the elder tall and dark the other short and fair both were strong healthy hearty lads full of spirit and fond enough of having their own way but thoroughly sound at heart and passionately fond of father and mother although trained to all kinds of farm work their education had not been by any means neglected they had had a good share of schooling and mr ross never went into the city without bringing back a new book or the latest magazine so that they might keep up with the spirit of the times the church festival bob spoke of was to take place the following evening at beauarnois a village that stood straight across the lake as the crow flies a distance of about eight miles the snow was in capital condition for snowshoeing and the two sturdy boys thought nothing of the tramp there and back they would start from home at four in the afternoon make beauarnois about six enjoy themselves there to the best of their ability until ten and then set off for home where they ought to turn up soon after midnight much to their gratification the cold next morning showed signs of moderating looks as if the weather clerk was interested in the festival remarked phil in the course of the morning his beaming face revealing clearly enough that others than the weather clerk were interested in the same event i am glad it isn't quite so keen as yesterday answered bob a fellow will enjoy the spread all the better for not going to it with his nose frozen i shouldn't wonder if we had a regular change said mr ross casting a searching glance at the sky which was evidently losing its sharp blue tinge and becoming ashen grey in colour we often do have a soft spell about this time of the year there'll most likely be snow soon i hope it won't begin before you get home boys oh i think not replied phil confidently it can't come much sooner than the morning the hours of the day slipped quickly by and sharp at four o'clock the two boys set forth on their long tramp they certainly were a prepossessing pair in their white blanket coats that became them so well tied with broad scarlet sashes and blue caps with scarlet tassels on their heads bidding good-bye to their parents who stood at the door watching them with fond pride phil and bob strode swiftly down the slope to the lake and soon were tramping over its broad bosom upon which the snow lay deep in undulating waves barring the leaden hue of the sky the afternoon could hardly have been finer the stinging cold was gone yet the air was keen enough to be bracing there was little or no wind. The snow was well packed, and, full of joyful expectations, the brothers walked on side by side, their broad snowshoes bearing them easily upon the very surface of the drifts. Eight miles in two hours was no remarkable performance for two such expert snowshoers as they, and they accomplished it without difficulty reaching their destination just as the bell in the tower of the church boomed out six solemn strokes. Leaving their coats and snowshoes at a friend's house, they hastened to the place where the festival was in full swing, and entered heartily into the enjoyments, each following his own bent. The expectations of both were fully satisfied. The supper presented more dainties on its generous bill of fare than even the capacious appetite of Bob could comfortably sample, and Phil was not disappointed in the light that shone from a certain pair of brown eyes, that for some mysterious reason had more attraction for him than anything else the entertainment offered. Ten o'clock came all too soon for him, especially as the festival was not entirely over, although some of those who lived at a distance had already left. But Bob was rather glad, as the last hour had been somewhat slow from his point of view, so siding up to phil he whispered discreetly in his ear time to go phil it's most ten o'clock phil pulled out his watch with an incredulous look but alas it told the same story as bob and dearly as he would have liked to linger 
he knew well enough that the sooner they started now the better so with a very regretful adieu to the one whose presence had made the assembly shine he joined his brother at the door when they got outside the look of the night and the feel of the air told them that the snow was nearer at hand than they had expected in fact a few soft sly flakes were already dropping noiselessly the friend at whose house they had left their coats and snowshoes suggested their staying all night but although bob was nothing loath phil would not be persuaded father said he'd wait up for us he objected and he'll get anxious if we're not home by twelve o'clock come along bob accordingly off they went into the darkness of the night when they reached the shore of the lake they could just see the glimmer of the village lights by which they were to be guided their home lying about half a mile to the left although their pace was far from a loitering one they did not get over the snow by any means so fast as in the afternoon bob was not only tired and sleepy but provoked with phil for refusing to stay all night at their friend's house indeed he hoped his brother would yet repent and return and so his feet dragged not a little noticing this phil said briskly step out bob we'll have all we can do to get across before the snow comes all well enough to say step out answered bob gruffly why couldn't you stay overnight i'm too tired to walk fast anyhow snow or no snow oh you're not tired bob you've eaten a little too much supper that's all rejoined phil pleasantly bob vouchsafed no answer and for some time the brothers tramped along in silence as they neared the centre of the lake the snowflakes which had at first been few and far between thickened rapidly and the wind at the same time rose into gusts that blew them sharply into the boys faces a thrill of alarm shot through phil and grasping bob's arm he called out it looks nasty bob let's put on a spurt at this appeal bob roused himself and quickening their paces to a trot they hastened onward their snowshoes rising and falling in steady unbroken step every minute the snow and wind increased until at length the storm in full force burst upon the boys and almost blew them off their feet all around them the air was filled with flakes of white whirling about in bewildering myriads splashing like fine spray into their faces and stinging like small shot for the wind was bitterly cold presently phil halted and peering hard into the blinding storm cried anxiously what's become of the lights bob i can't see them a bit can you no panted bob let's turn back no use in that replied phil turning round i can't see those behind us either there's nothing for it but to push ahead oh phil are we lost asked bob with quivering lips phil was more than half afraid they were but to reassure bob he answered cheerfully it's all right i know how to steer come along and grasping bob's hand he started off again on and on they plodded through storm and snow phil half dragging bob who between fright and real weariness found difficulty in making progress at all for half an hour more they struggled thus until at last bob dropped his brother's hand and flung himself down in the snow sobbing out despairingly it's no use phil i'm dead beat you'll have to go on without me nonsense bob said phil taking him by the shoulder jump up and go at it again thus helped to his feet bob made another attempt but had not gone more than a quarter of a mile in a way that was staggering rather than walking before down he slipped again and this time all that phil could do failed to rouse him from his stupor the cold and exhaustion had completely overcome him he had but one thought and that was to be allowed to sleep phil fully realized the danger and tired as he was himself put forth every exertion to keep his brother awake he even tried to drag him along by his sash in what he thought was the right direction but of course soon found this impossible 
desert his brother he would not, though they died together. So, in order to keep himself from falling into the same state, he made a circle around him, walking slowly. While doing this, he encountered a high drift, whose lee afforded some shelter from the blast. An idea flashed into his mind, which he instantly proceeded to execute. Returning to Bob, he dragged him with infinite difficulty to this spot. Then, slipping off one of his snowshoes, he proceeded to cover his body with snow, leaving nothing but his head exposed. The poor boy, now fast asleep, offering no objection to such strange bedclothes. Then, sitting down beside him, with the big drift protecting his back, he let the snow gather over himself, hoping he hardly knew for what, and praying for the Lord who sent the snowstorm to have mercy on them both. In a vague way, for the stupor was fast creeping upon him too, he wondered if his father had begun to miss them yet, and whether he would come out in search of them. He even dimly pictured his father sitting in the parlour at home, reading his book, and pausing every now and then to listen for his boy's voices. His mother, he knew, would have gone to bed long ago. He felt relieved that the snow no longer stung his face, and that the wind had gone down completely, and so his thoughts wandered on until he knew no more. One hour, two hours passed, and the drifting snow had hidden the forms of the two boys from sight, when a long line of men might have been seen coming from the village and scanning carefully every mound and swell of the snow as they hastened onward. In advance of the rest strode Mr. Ross, his face full of grave anxiety, his eyes intent upon the white plain before him that seemed to have so little to tell. Now bounding on ahead, and now returning to look up in his face with inquiring eyes, was his wise old collie, Oscar, without whom he never went abroad. "'Find them, Oscar! Find them! Good dog!' would Mr. Ross say encouragingly, and the sagacious animal would dart on again. Presently he stopped beside a drift, now grown to huge proportions, sniffed sharply at the snow, and then proceeded to dig into it with eager, vigorous paws. Observing his action, Mr. Ross uttered a cry of joy, and sprang forward to the dog's side. Going down on his knees, he tore at the snowbank in a frenzy of haste. In another moment a red tassel appeared, then a blue cap, then a white still face, and, others coming to his aid, the forms of the two boys were exposed to view, Phil still sitting up with his head bent over his knees, and Bob lying comfortably beside him. That they were both alive was clear enough, for they were breathing, very faintly to be sure, but undoubtedly breathing. Mr. Ross caught up one after another in a passionate embrace. Then litters were quickly improvised out of blanket coats, stripped from willing backs, and soon the unconscious boys were speeding homeward as fast as stalwart arms could bear them. The rest of the story is quickly told. Thanks to the sturdy frames and perfect constitutions, the brothers were only temporarily the worse for their experience. They both were frostbitten, of course. Bob's poor nose and Phil's feet coming in for the worst of it. But a few weeks' good nursing cured everything, and no scars remained to remind them, had they ever been likely to forget it, of the night they were lost. End of section 28section twenty nine of my strange rescue this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gillian hendry my strange rescue by james macdonald oxley ice skating in canada it is a glorious winter afternoon and having left the smoke and din and dust of the city far behind, we are standing together at the foot of the first of the Dartmouth lakes. Straight before us, and spreading far out on either hand, lies a glistening expanse, whose polished surface 
flashes back the cheerful sunshine. Three unbroken miles in length, and more than one in width, this icy plain awaits us in its virgin purity. It were strange, then, did not our fingers tremble with impatience, and our acmes snap with feverish haste. They are on at last, and now for the supremest luxury of motion. The crisp, cool air is charged with electricity. Every answering nerve tingles delightfully, and the blood leaps responsively through the throbbing pulses. Once out upon the ringing ice, and we seem to have passed from the realm of solid flesh and blood to that of tricksy, dainty Ariel. We have broken loose from the bonds of gravitation, and as with favouring wind we speed away to the farther shore, every stroke of our steel-shod feet counting good for a quartet of yards, the toiling and moiling of the workaday world seem to have found at the margin of the lake a magic barrier beyond which they may not follow us, and with spirits light and free we glide off into a new sphere where care and labour are unknown. Mile after mile flashes past, yet our muscles weary not, nor does the breath grow short. But what is this? Is our flight already ended, and must we turn back so soon? The fur-clad shores, which were a little while ago so far apart, have drawn together, until they seem to meet not far ahead, and put a bar to further progress. A cunning turn, a short, quick dash over the dangerous spot, where the current runs swiftly and the ice bends ominously, and behold, we are out again upon a second lake, still larger than the first, and dotted here and there with tiny evergreen islets, that look like emeralds in a silver setting. For three miles more our way lies before us smooth and clear, and then at last, as having reached the limit of our enterprise, we throw ourselves upon a fallen tree, to rest our now tired limbs, and catch our diminished breath, I ask which of wheelman, horseman, yachtsman, sculler, or skater, enjoys the finest exercise. No country in the world presents better facilities for indulgence in the luxury of skating than Canada. Holland may with propriety boast of her smooth canals, Norway of her romantic fjords, Scotland for her poetic lochs, but for variety of lake, river, canal, pond, and frozen sea, from the majestic St. Lawrence to the humblest stream that affords delight to the village red-cheeked lads and lasses, Canada is unsurpassed. It is no wonder, then, that the Canadians are a nation of skaters, and that the skating rinks should be as indispensable an adjunct to every city, town, and village as the church and the concert hall. With a season extending over four and often five months, the managers of rinks can count upon receiving profitable returns upon their capital, and so those institutions multiply. Owing to the great quantity of snow which every winter brings, the season for outdoor skating in Canada is very short, consisting usually of the middle weeks of December, when Jack Frost, by thoughtfully anticipating the snow, allows of a fortnight skating in the open air before the mantle of winter hides his handiwork from sight and juice. As a natural consequence, Canadians are not remarkable for long-distance skating, and two winters ago the swiftest flyers of our land had to lower their banner before Mr. Axel Paulson, the renowned Norwegian skater, who made a triumphant tour through Canada and the United States. On the other hand, the long season enjoyed by the rinks enables all who will take the trouble, and do not shrink from a novitiate of bumps and bruises, to become exceedingly expert at fancy skating, and it is hardly debatable that the rinks of Toronto, Montreal, Halifax, and St. John can send forth skaters who, for grace, precision, and intricacy of movement, would find no superiors in the world. When Mr. Paulson attempted to teach the Canadians fancy skating, he was somewhat chagrined to find himself soon reduced to the position of learner. As an ice acrobat, he did indeed perform one or two feats that were novel, 
but they had only to be seen to be immediately copied, while some of the Canadians were able to open his eyes to possibilities of didos, which he thought it not best to hurriedly attempt. His visit was of permanent value, however, because it awakened a deeper interest in long-distance skating, and one may safely venture to prophesy that, should Mr. Paulson come this way again, he will find the defeat of his whilom opponents at long distances not quite such a holiday task as on the occasion of his last visit. What is known in England as figure skating, and there very ardently indulged in by well-to-do members of the various clubs who can afford to acquire the art in Norway or Scotland, is but little practised in Canada. It is not suitable for rinks, as it requires so much room, and can only be done to advantage in large open spaces, which the figurists may have all to themselves. Figure skating is undoubtedly very effective and striking when executed by a band of well-disciplined skaters who thoroughly understand one another. But it is so elaborate, and takes so much time, both in preparation and performance, that it is not suited to the latitude of a colony where the majority of those who skate have no surplus leisure, and want to make the most of the time at their disposal for recreation. There is one phase of figure skating, however, which does flourish throughout Canada, to wit, dancing, and it would delight the heart of Tipsichory herself to watch a well-skilled quartet of couples gliding through the mazes of the lancers, or quadrille, or sweeping around in airy circles to the music of the waltz. The evolutions differ somewhat, of course, from the steps taken on the floor, but the identity of the dance is far from being lost, and the pleasure of the dancer is greatly enhanced through the surpassing ease of motion. This dancing on the ice may be seen in its perfection at Halifax, the capital of Nova Scotia, which, being a garrison city, enjoys the unique privilege of military bands, and the officers, as a rule, becoming enthusiastic skaters, the ladies who grace the fashionable rink by their presence have a grand time of it, gliding entrancingly about to the bewitching strains of delightful music, and bringing all the artillery of their thrilling eyes, tempting cheeks, and enslaving lips to bear upon the gallant sons of Mars, who oftentimes find the slippery floor more fatal than the tented field. The finest rinks in Canada are those in Montreal, Halifax, and St. John. The rink at Halifax is really the crystal palace of the exhibition grounds, and for size, appearance, and convenience is surpassed by none. One of the most cheerful sights imaginable is this vast building on band night, when the snow-white arena is almost hidden beneath a throng of happy skaters, youths and maidens, circling round hand in hand, the maiden glowing with pride at her admirer's dexterity, the youth enraptured by his charmer's roseate winsomeness. Here doth Cupid bid defiance to the chilling blasts of winter, and although the poets and painters have conspired to confine him to a garb appropriate to the dog days, the sly wielder of the fatal bow must in winter enwrap himself in furry garments, and like a tiny Santa Claus, perch his chubby form unseen among the rafters, and from that coin of vantage let fly his shafts, thick and fast, into the merry company beneath. One of the chief attractions of skating for the ambitious disciple is that there is practically no limit to its possibilities in the way of invention and combination. It would be extremely difficult to prepare for any skating tournament a hard and fast programme which would meet every requirement. Hence, in competitions of this kind, the custom is to lay down some twenty or thirty of the best known feats which every competitor is supposed to do and then leave each contestant to superadd thereto such marvels of skill as he may have picked up or invented. At the same time, of course, there may be almost as many degrees of skill represented in the execution of the set programme as there are competitors, and the judges must take this fully into consideration when making their award, and not allow their judgment to be dazzled by some particularly striking extra. 
Skating tournaments, however, are not as frequent as they ought to be, while every other recognised sport has its regularly recurring trials of proficiency. Skating has hitherto been inexplicably neglected. Surely nothing could be more interesting or attractive than a gathering of accomplished skaters of both sexes, vying with one another in the ease and grace with which they can illustrate the intricacies of the grapevine, the difficulty of the giant swing, or the rapidity of the locomotive. Trials of speed are common enough at all rinks, and are undoubtedly more popular and exciting than trials of skill, but the more refined and less demoralising competition should not be entirely neglected. The speed attained by those who race in rinks, it need hardly be explained, affords no criterion whatever whereby to judge of what fast skaters are competent to accomplish. The incessant turns, the sharp corners, the confined area, all tend to materially reduce the rate of progression, and only out on some broad lake or long extending reach of river can the skater do his best. I have no records at hand as I write, but my own experience justifies me in venturing the assertion that a champion skater in perfect form, and properly equipped with long-bladed racing skates, would prove no mean antagonist for Maud S. herself, over a measured mile, while at longer distances he would have the field to himself. Like all other amusements, skating in Canada waxes and wanes in popular estimation, according to the mysterious laws of human impulse. One winter, skating will be voted not the thing, and the rinks will be deserted. The next they will be crowded, and even the heads of families will be fishing out their rusty acmes from the lumber closet and renewing their youth in the icy arena. As a means of exercise during the long weary months of winter, when the deep snow renders walking a toil devoid of pleasure, and the muscles are aching for employment, the skating rink is an unspeakable boon, especially to him whose lot it is to endure much dry drudgery at the desk's dead wood. An hour's brisk spinning around will clear the befogged brain, brace up the lax frame, and give a keenness to the appetite that nothing else could do. Then the rink has its social as well as its sanitary advantages. During the winter months it affords both sexes a pleasant and convenient rendezvous, where, unhampered by the conventionalities of the ballroom, and aided by the cheerful inspiration of the exercise, they can enjoy one another's society with a frequency otherwise unattainable. On band days, indeed, the rink becomes converted into a spacious salle d'assemblée, where the numbered programme of musical selections enables Corydon to make engagements in advance with Phyllis, and thus ensure the prosperous prosecution of his suit. A carnival on ice, and every rink has one or more during the season, affords a rarely interesting and brilliant spectacle. For these occasions, the building dons its gala dress, the gaunt rafters are hung with banners, the walls are hidden beneath variegated bunting and festooned with spruce embroidery. Lights gleam brightly from every nook and corner, and the ice is prepared with special care. Then, as the motley crowd glides swiftly by, one may behold representatives of every clime and nation mingling together in perfect amity. It is true, the tawny Spaniard, the dark-eyed Italian, the impassive Turk, the appalling Zulu, the soft and silent Hindu, and others whose home lies beneath the southern skies, betray a familiarity with the ice which seems to cast some doubt upon its genuineness. But when his satanic majesty himself, with barbed tail and cloven hoof, confesses to an intimacy with the mazy evolutions of the Philadelphia grapevine, the incongruity attaching to visitors from cooler climes appears less striking, and they may go on their way unchallenged. Sometimes masks are de rigueur at these carnivals, and then the inevitable clown and harlequin have unlimited license till even Quakers and friars, infected by their bad example, vie with them in mad pranks, 
and the fun soon waxes furious. Masked or unmasked, the carnival skaters have a joyous time, and the hours steal away with cruel haste. Such are some of the phases of ice skating in Canada. If this article has seemed to be devoted principally to indoor skating, it is because that can be pursued through so much greater a portion of the winter than the outdoor kind. Skating in its perfection is of course only to be had in the open air, and my most delightful recollections are associated with the Dartmouth lakes of happy memory. Connected with the same lakes, however, there is a recollection too thrilling to be delightful, and which, in view of what might have been, brings a shudder even now while I rehearse it. It happened in my college days. I had been skating all the afternoon, and as the dusk grew on apace, found myself away down at the head of the second lake, full six miles from the point where I had got on the ice. So girding up my loins, I set my face towards home, and struck out lustily. After going about one hundred yards, I thought I heard the sound of my name come faintly to me over the ice. Wheeling sharply about, I saw nothing except a dark form some distance away, which, through the gathering gloom, resembled a log or tree branch, and I was just about to start off again, when once more my name was called, this time so clearly as to leave no chance for doubt, the sound evidently coming from the seeming log. Hastening over to it with all speed, I was startled to find the professor of classics at my college, who did not allow the loss of an arm to debar him from the pleasure of skating lying on the ice with his left leg broken sharp and clear a few inches above the ankle the result of a sudden and heavy fall here indeed was a trying situation for a mere lad to cope with we were alone in a wilderness of ice and six miles away from the nearest house the shadows of night were fast closing around us those six miles had to be gotten over in some way and there was not a moment to be lost. Hurrying to the shore, I cut down a small spruce tree. Upon this the helpless sufferer was laid as gently as possible, and bound to it with straps. Then, upon this rude ambulance, I slowly dragged him down the lake, while he, with splendid self-control, instead of murmuring at his terrible agony, charmed away my weariness by his unconquerable heroism. It was a toilsome task, but help came when we reached the first lake, and once the shore was gained, a long express wagon filled with mattresses made the homeward journey comparatively painless. All is well that ends well. The broken leg soon mended, and the following winter found the professor skating as briskly as ever. Yet I cannot help wondering sometimes with a shudder how it would have fared with the interpreter of Greece and Rome, had not that first faint call reached my ears. A bitter cold night, a wide expanse of polished ice, a solitary man lying prone upon it, with one arm missing at the shoulder, and one leg broken at the ankle. It were little less than a miracle if ice skating in Canada had not been clouded by one more catastrophe that winter night. End of section 29 Section 30 of My Strange Rescue This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley Section 70 The Wild Dogs of Athabasca Old Donald Mitovish was a wonderfully interesting character. In the service of the Hudson Bay Company, which for nearly two hundred years held regal sway over the vast unknown northwest of Canada, he had spent half a century of arduous and exciting service, living far away from civilization one of a mere handful of white men in the midst of a wilderness sparsely inhabited by the indian and the half-breed 
but abounding in deer buffaloes bears wolves and the smaller animals he had risen rapidly in the service for he was a fearless staunch trustworthy man and for the latter half of two terms had filled the important post of chief factor at different forts for it was his somewhat undesirable if honourable lot to be sent to those stations that gave the most trouble and the least returns to the company such was his reputation for shrewdness courage and fidelity that it was felt by the authorities that no other man could so soon set matters straight as donald mctavish having filled out his fifty years with entire satisfaction to his employers and no small credit to himself he had retired on his laurels to spend a hale and hearty old age in the enjoyment of the comfortable pension awarded him by the company which he had served so well it was the delight of his declining days to recount for the benefit of younger ears the many thrilling incidents of his adventurous career and one of his favorite stories was that which i shall now attempt to tell as nearly as possible in his own words it was early in the fifties when i had charge of old fort assiniboine away out on the athabasca river not far from the rockies sir george simpson the governor of the colony at red river like the thoughtful man he was had sent out to me by the spring brigade a splendid scotch stag hound one of half a dozen he had just brought with him from the dear old land oh man but he was a dog his back was on a level with my belt and when he raised himself on his hind legs he could put his forepaws on my shoulders and rub noses with me yet i stood a good six feet in my stockings in those days his hair was as grizzled as old aphram's and coarse and curled like what they stuff beds with his body was long and lean and so was his head but he had a noble eye and then the way he could run and leap over everything that came in his path it was a sight to see i warrant you we soon got very much attached to each other and wherever i went bruce went too he did not seem to take to any one else and i was just as well pleased that he did not for i never wanted him out of my sight that same summer a new hand was sent to the fort he was an englishman who gave his name as heathcote and he brought with him a pure white female bulldog that was one of the most dangerous-looking brutes i ever laid eyes on she minded nobody but her master of whom to do her credit she seemed fond enough i never much cared for that breed of dog but i must say vixen was about perfect in her way as to good breeding there certainly wasn't much to choose between her and bruce i was a little uneasy as to how the two dogs would get on and at first it did look as if there might be trouble for bruce who utterly despised the rabble of curs hanging about the fort evidently felt disposed to resent the coming of this possible rival but almost before i knew it the two were the best of friends and would eat their dinner side by side like two well-behaved children after a while they took to going out a-hunting together and grand times they had they would work along in company until a herd of deer was started and then bruce would make for the fattest doe his tremendous speed soon bringing him to her throat while vixen following at her best rate would come up just in time to help him finish her and then they would have a fine feast once the dogs got into these ways neither heathcote nor i had much more satisfaction out of them they were never on hand when wanted they kept growing wilder and wilder and finally toward autumn they disappeared one day and were never seen at the fort again we hunted for them high and low sending out the half-breeds as far as lake la crosse on the east and to the foothills of the rockies on the west but not a sign or trace could we find of them when winter came and they did not return we gave them up as lost thinking that something must have happened to them on one of their hunting forays or that perchance they had been killed by the indians two years went by and bruce and vixen were almost forgotten when stories began to reach the fort of a strange and fierce kind of wild dog that was being seen now and then by hunters and trappers in the out-of-the-way valleys and ravines of the foothills it was not an easy job to get at the bottom of these stories for they passed from mouth to mouth before reaching us but at last a trapper turned up 
who had seen a pack of the dogs himself and after hearing his description i had no longer any doubt but that these wild dogs which were making such a stir were the offspring of our two former pets who had gone away in company by all accounts they were evidently dangerous brutes to meet from bruce they had got wonderful speed and endurance from vixen ferocity and fearlessness swift savage stubborn and always going in large packs there was not an animal on the plains or up among the mountains for which they were not more than a match i felt eager to get a sight of the creatures even though it should mean some risk for while like all wild dogs willing enough to give men a wide berth there was no telling what they might do if pressed by hunger it was therefore good news when a year later orders came from red river for me to make a trip to fort george on the other side of the rockies where there were some matters that needed straightening up as either going or coming back i would run a good chance of seeing something of the famous dogs i left fort assany boyne in the autumn and although a sharp lookout was kept by all the party as we went over to fort george not a sight nor sign of the dogs did we stumble upon but on my way back in the spring i had better luck and i certainly shall never forget my first and last sight of those terrible brutes we had crossed the rockies and were descending the eastern slopes getting down among the foothills one day heathcote and i pushed on together in advance of the rest both of us having the dogs on our mind early in the afternoon we came to a bluff that overlooked a lovely little valley which we at once decided would be our camping place for the night a bright stream ran along the center of the valley having thought that perhaps a herd of deer might put in an appearance if we kept out of sight we stretched ourselves out comfortably on the bluff and awaited developments they proved to be interesting beyond all our expectations we had been there about an hour perhaps when heathcote who had been looking over at the opposite bluff suddenly grasped my arm saying under his breath look there batavish what do you think of that a break in the bluff had made a sort of easy descent into the valley and down this were coming in single file one two three four no less than a dozen bears of the large and dreaded silver tip kind splendid fellows most of them bent on having a good time on the sunny slopes beside the stream we hardly dared to stir or breathe to have attacked them would have been utter madness thankful might we be if we could crawl away without their attacking us while lying there motionless and wishing to the bottom of our hearts that the rest of the party were on hand to make matters even a fierce bark came from the bluff a little above where the bears first showed themselves it was followed by a whole chorus of deep mouthed baying and an instant later there rushed into view fairly tumbling over one another in the impetuous haste a great pack of dogs that we at once recognized as those we wished to see they were certainly a fearsome lot of creatures some were long lean and shaggy like bruce others were thick-bodied and smooth of hair like vixen and all were powerful ravenous-looking brutes a dozen of whom might eat a good-sized buffalo for dinner without feeling uncomfortably overloaded after their meal they sighted the bears the moment they reached the edge of the bluff and at once rushed down to the attack barking as though they would split their throats the bears made ready to receive them by massing together at the top of a little knoll near the water and before we could fully realize what was taking place the fight had begun so far as we could make out the dogs numbered fifty at least so that considering their size and strength the odds were a good deal in their favor but the bears fought like heroes at first they crowded together in a sort of circle with heads facing out while the dogs ran round them snarling and barking and watching their their chance to spring a few moments later the circle was broken up into a dozen roaring writhing yelping groups composed of a bear with four or five of the dogs clinging tenaciously to different parts of its body it was the vixen strain that told now again and again would the bear rising on its hind quarters hurl the dogs from him with mighty sweeps of his huge forepaws only to be pinned at once and brought to the ground by a fresh attack at frequent intervals an agonizing death howl would pierce its way through the horrible clamor as some unfortunate dog 
caught in the grasp of its maddened enemy would be crushed to death in its resistless embrace the minutes slipped by and the fight still raged but there could be no doubt how it would result the dogs had the best of it as to numbers and they were the equals of the bears in courage ferocity and endurance if not in sheer strength one by one the big brown bodies rolled over in the stillness of death at the end of about half an hour the fight was over not a bear breathed and around their torn carcasses lay between twenty and thirty of the dogs as dead as themselves the best possible proof of how fiercely and obstinately they had fought not a word had passed between heathcote and myself while all this went on we were too much taken up with the extraordinary conflict going on before our eyes even to look at each other but when it was all over and the surviving dogs having satisfied themselves that the bears were really all dead lay down to lick their many wounds before they began upon the feast their brave victims had provided for them i touched heathcote on the shoulder and whispered we've seen the dogs let's take good care they don't see us after such a proof of their powers as we had had we were in no mind to claim a nearer acquaintance with them on the score of having once owned their ancestors accordingly we crawled noiselessly away and making a long circuit rejoined our party in time to prevent their turning down into the valley which we no longer considered a good place to camp in for the night that was my first and last sight of the wild dogs of Alabasca. the following autumn i went east and never returned to fort assany boyne whether the dogs have since been all killed off or are still running wild among the far recesses of the rockies i don't know but that wonderful battle in the valley was one of the greatest sights of my life and like of which no one perhaps will ever again see on this continent end of section thirty the wild dogs of athabasca